Good fences make good neighbors, a line from the poem Mending Wall from San Francisco born poet Robert Frost. This quote emphasizes the importance of respecting each other's boundaries to maintain friendly and healthy neighborly relations. Environmental justice encourages industry to look over the fence. Environmental justice, the latest update on the Tosca implementation and the Inflation Reduction Act are the topics of today's interview. I'm privileged to discuss these topics with Michal Friedhoff, Assistant Administrator of the US EPA's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention and Kelly Peterson, Director of Product Stewardship and Regulatory Affairs at the ICP Group. Ladies, welcome. Michal, could you please clarify the concept of environmental justice and explain its importance? Sure. I mean, and basically the concept of environmental justice means that everyone has the right to breathe clean air and drink clean water, no matter what zip code they live in, how much money they make, or what color their skin is. Uh, it was, you know, it was a movement that kind of grew out of the civil rights movement. Uh, for example, people think of Cesar Chavez as someone very much associated with the labor rights movement, but he actually came to see protecting farm workers from pesticide poisoning as being more important than fair wages. So then in the 80s, the term started to be used uh, after a series of protests about siting of landfills in Houston and the concern that they were always sited in predominantly African-American or other minority neighborhoods. And Dr. Robert Bullard, in fact, actually found a study and found that 75 or 80 percent of all incinerators and landfills were placed in in disadvantaged communities. So fundamentally what we're doing at EPA is we're, we're trying very hard to, to right those wrongs um, but have clearly a great deal of work to do because it's you know decades and decades of, of these sorts of injustices that have continued. Okay and um, can you tell us some successful cases of environmental justice in uh, action? Sure. I mean so so one of the things that it, it, one of, one of the problems in environmental justice, for example, is was the siting of highways. All across America, as highways were being built, decisions were made to site them right in the middle of disadvantaged communities. And the, commun the neighborhoods were raised, sometimes very vibrant communities were destroyed. And in one case, for example, when the, when the Cross Bronx Expressway was built and Robert Moses wanted to put it right through a very densely populated neighborhood, a very vibrant, live, alive community, uh, there were protests. And his response was, yeah, we got a lot of critics in New York, so let's get rid of them. And he did. So communities are destroyed, the people that remain end up breathing you know, dirty air all day every day. And that was replicated really all across America in a number of different, in, in many different cities. So one of the success stories is in the, in the bipartisan inf infrastructure law, there, were, there was actually some funding for the Department of Transportation to address that. And, what, and so there's a community, for example, in Minnesota, where I think it's in, called the Rondo neighborhood, completely destroyed the community when the highway was built through there. And descendants of the people who used to live there got a grant to build an above road, you know, open space with, with parks and ways to, to connect neighborhoods. I think in Detroit, there is, they're, they're actually taking a part of this highway down and building a boulevard with bike lanes and retail establishments to reconnect these communities that were, that were pulled apart as these highways were, were, were built in their neighborhoods. Great examples, I would say. Michal, you, but also EPA, is mm -hmm. really committed to make the new environmental and climate justice program a success. I read that via the Inflation Reduction Act, three billion US dollar is in funding is available. Can you tell us more about this unique opportunity for industry? Sure. I mean, I think there's there's a, a variety of different grant programs that we're standing up. So, for example, in the Chemical Safety Office, we have $100 million over five years that are for pollution prevention grants, and some of them have a specific focus on environmental justice. And really what those grants do is provide technical assistance to businesses to help them reduce pollution at the source, uh, in some cases focused specifically on reducing pollution in disadvantaged communities. In other cases, um, it's related to increasing access to sustainable products in those same communities. There's other grants that the agency's receiving that are that are about community-based air monitoring or 
uh, you know, ensuring that there's climate resilience and, and adaptation, trying to find ways to reduce sources of indoor pollution. Uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunities. Wonderful. Kelly, um, has industry already ideas how to make good use of this enormous budget for uh, environmental and climate justice? Well, while enormous, there might uh, be some challenges in trying to figure out which program, you know, which criteria, which community, you know, you're operating in, and uh, which grant specifically. Um, we can look to do things like reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and, you know, go to energy service providers for projects to help us uh, become more energy efficient. We can look for, like you said, the, the technical expertise to, to facilitate some of these uh, projects related to, you know, equipment or the output of the equipment. So there are a lot of opportunities. I think it remains to be seen in general, but it will definitely depend on the communities in which we operate and the type of programs and grants available. Talking about money, in November last year, mm -hmm. EPA announced a proposal to increase the Tosca fees. Why was this necessary and has this proposal already been formalized as a rule mm -hmm. now? No, I haven't finalized it yet, first of all, but uh, you know when Congress wrote Tosca and I was, I was part of the negotiations there, Congress knew that it was giving the agency a dramatic increase in work and responsibility. And they also gave EPA the authority to collect about 25% of some of the TOSCA costs and fees. But unfortunately, uh, the first fees rule didn't kick in until the beginning of 2019. It used as its baseline the costs of implementing the old law before it was turned into this expansive new authority. It exempted the costs of the first 10 risk evaluations, which were by far the most expensive things that the agency was doing in those early years. And as a result, collected only 13% of a really artificially low baseline from fees. So between that and the failure for all four years of the last administration to ever ask Congress for any additional money made it pretty much impossible for EPA to meet really a single deadline for either, an exi either its existing chemical or new chemicals work. So in the 2022 and 2023 appropriations laws, uh, Congress explicitly told the agency to be considering the actual costs, what it actually takes to implement new TOSCA as written by Congress, and to use that to form the basis of our fees rule, and that's what we did. Thank you. I think this makes perfectly sense. Uh, Kelly, as a taxpayer and an industry rep representative, does it make sense to you as well? Fundamentally, it makes sense. I cannot say that I agree with the amount, right? But I understand the need, right? There are definitely need for resources, both financially and human. And uh, the timing to implement TASCA has mm -hmm. been a challenge. So mm -hmm. fundamentally understand, somewhat disagree. <laughs> OK. Um, Besides the Tosca fee rule, there was another major change. In 2021, EPA decided to issue a single risk determination for each chemical undergoing evaluation pursuant to its whole chemical approach. Why this different approach and what is the impact of it? So I think, you know, when I was, on, when I was negotiating the law, um, I think we were pretty clearly wanting EPA to do a comprehensive look at a chemical and make a determination about whether that chemical posed an unreasonable risk under its conditions of use. I think there's been some fear on industry's part that what we'll do is we'll, we'll kind of find one, one risky use and just you know, take out our big red stamp and say, dangerous, this is bad. And, and honestly, that's, that's not what we're doing. We're, we're still gonna be looking at every single use of, of the chemical. We'll still be communicating to people you know, which of the uses really drive the unreasonable risk and which don't. Um, and I think we'll generally be looking at regulating the most risky uses, the ones that drive the risk. But we won't be doing that every single time. And here's an example. You know, when we find, when the last administration finalized a partial ban on consumer uses of methylene chloride as a paint stripper, 
The regulation was aimed at the distribution and commerce of methylene chloride to consumers or to retail organizations that were then going to sell it to consumers. Even though there wasn't any risk found at all associated with distribution and commerce, the risk was with the consumer use. And so I think what, what whole chemical will let us do is it, you know, is, is really be able to come up with a with a fairly holistic pronouncement of the way in which this chemical can continue to be used safely. And that's really what we're striving for. So basically you go for a more pragmatic approach. So mm -hmm. if uh, uh, the condition of use is a risk, but if you use a PPE, then it's still fine. So the whole concept of risk-based seems to have shifted towards hazard-based. Kelly, what are your thoughts about this? Uh, again, fundamentally, I can understand why that is the shift. Uh, you know, if we go back to the very basic um, risk, if you will, is an integration of hazard and exposure, mm -hmm. then exposure with all of its variability, right, and all of its uncertainty and, um, you know, need for a little bit of guesstimation. I understand why that would be the challenging variable. Therefore, you target hazard, right? It leaves out all of those, you know, um, necessary uh, variables that need to be considered. You know, how frequently are people exposed to things? What is the duration of it? What is the potency of it, right? You can't tell something uh, or mitigate risk specifically just with hazard. You have to consider the exposure variables, right? And I believe that's on the books in a lot of these uh, policies and regs. So I understand why you would target hazard, but you're leaving out a very critical piece in doing risk mitigation, and that's what we're here to do, right? And I'll just say, you know, in response to that, mm -hmm. so one of the reasons we did that is because, there's a whole bunch of reasons really, but one of them is that there's pretty clear evidence that workers aren't always equipped with PPE and don't always use it appropriately. And, you know, OSHA rules don't actually apply to self-employed workers, and they also don't apply to state workers in states that don't have OSHA health programs. And then if you go on the OSHA website and you go and you look at their, you click on their chemical safety webpage, the very first sentence says, these standards are outdated and inadequate to protect workers. So we are fully committed to considering what industry uses to protect their workers in the risk management phase. But we felt that with such overwhelming evidence of the insufficiency of what was already on the books that we couldn't really assume that it was okay. So I think we're very committed and extremely interested in getting that data that you were talking about, Kelly, where, you know, where if, if, if a company can come to us and show us, hey, look, this is our monitoring data of our workers, there's no exposures, they're protected, um, and this is how we do it, we're, we're actually extremely interested in getting information like that, and absolutely we'll be factoring that in as we, as we move into the rulemaking stage. Okay, so uh, that gives an idea on the data that are needed mm -hmm. for risk mitigation. Yeah. Can industry provide that? Do you have testing programs in place or monitoring programs? Yeah, there's a lot of monitoring that goes on today, right? Mm -hmm. And um, data that's already been captured over decades of, of time, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yes, it's just a matter of compiling that and providing that information, but also understanding how EPA is going to use that data, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and you know whether or not it will actually serve the purpose. Again, we're trying to mitigate risk on both sides, and mm -hmm. if that data is appropriate to do that, mm -hmm. then yes. I mean, I feel like my staff would love to get that data, and and I think we do get it sometimes. We get it from mm -hmm. some companies, not others. So there's some conditions of use that you'll sure. see you'll see addressed in these proposed rules that we're coming out with later this spring, where where it's really kind of fleshed out and specific, and others where where there isn't the granularity that we'd like. And part of that is because we we just don't have the information from industry that we sometimes feel we need. So I'd really just just make a pitch for <laughs> for everyone uh, to. To, to, to bring us the information, it can't, I, 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 th I think it can only help make our rules more protective and scientifically and legally defensible in the end. Considering that all conditions of use will now go through a risk mitigation process, how will EPA distinguish those conditions of use that are controlled in an industrial workplace? 
So first of all, let me just be, be clear. I don't think we've made a blanket decision to regulate every condition of use. I think we're, we've made a decision to, to talk about risk as it relates to the whole chemical substance, but we're generally planning on focusing our efforts on the uses that are the most risky. I can assure you that we know that a large chemical company and the way that it uses a chemical is different than, say, a self-employed home renovation company. We know that, and I think our rules will reflect that. So I think there's just been a bit of a fear of the unknown here as we, you know, as we're just about to propose all of these rules, and, and I, think, I, I think companies are, are just scared. They're thinking that any time we find risk, we're gonna ban the chemical, and I don't, I don't really think that's our philosophy. I think our, our working philosophy is if there's a way for the chemical to, be continue, to continue to be used safely, we're, we're gonna write down how the chemical can continue to be used safely. So basically, if industry in a professional way will use and, uh, the chemicals, then it should be okay. They shouldn't mm -hmm. fear things. Do you have some fear still? I think a bit of that fear comes from uh, interpretation versus the verbiage and the documentation of the actual regs that are out there. Um, I think that the way that it's intended to go, EPA, uh, pretty much aligns with how industry would like to see it go, mm -hmm. right? Um, we understand that you want to regulate the riskiest conditions mm -hmm. of use and not regulate every condition of use. Um, but when you take the whole chemical approach, yes, there is some mm -hmm. concern that some of those that are have already been determined, right, to n not be an unreasonable risk or uh, have not had a determination, they're just going to be lumped in as it is a risk because it is associated with this chemical, period, or you know, this chemical in general is a risk. So it's yeah. important when you, when you sort of read the law and mm -hmm. you say, and you look at the remedies that the law gives the agency when it finds risk, it's everything from labeling to banning. A lot of room yes. in between labeling and banning. And, Quite a bit. And, and, yes. I, and I do think you'll see a diversity of requirements and, and, and different approaches for different types of uses as we start to propose these rules later this spring. Okay. Very good. Michal, has EPA also considered how the additional risk mitigation measures will impact existing plant safety practices uh, uh, that were required by OSHA? Uh, we discussed PPE, but there are other HESCOM practices and stuff like that as well. Has that been taken into account? Absolutely. We've looked, I mean, I think I mentioned the OSHA chemical safety standards are from the 1970s. Um, and they're, they are outdated and inadequate. That's what OSHA says about them too. And our staff are on the phone with OSHA constantly trying to make sure that we can build on their practices and their record keeping and try to, you know, try to avoid redundancy and duplicativeness. And I think we're looking at some of those other standards too, like the industrial hygiene standards. And I know different states and different countries have to have, have their versions also. I think we're, we're being pretty methodical about looking at each of them and where there are differences, trying to understand why there are differences between what we're coming up with and, and, their st and, and, and what their standards say. And sometimes it's because the science is different, the, the, there's more known about the chemical now than there was even 20 years ago. Sometimes it's a difference in the assumptions where we might be assuming eight hours a day and they might be assuming twice a year. I, I mean, there's, there's, always, there's always some differences. And, and, I, and I think what we're trying to do is make sure that when we are deviating from another set of standards, that we're that we're that it's that our decision to do that is based in the science and the law. Yeah, you're working towards an alignment, basically. It's what you say, <laughs> Kelly. What is the impact of industry of this mix of requirements in the day-to-day -day practice? Uh, you both just touched on it. The word I was going to use is alignment. You know, we want to make sure that these things aren't inconsistent. If we are already mm -hmm. following an established and mandated practice, whether you know industry or OSHA or otherwise, we want to make sure that you know complying with one does not put us in violation with another, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And also that it's not arbitrary. Uh, you know, you want some substantiated and, like you said, science-based uh, backing for this. So, as long as that's the case. I think the impact is going to be minimal, but if that's not the case, then obviously it will be much more of a challenge. Okay. Good news is all these mm -hmm. rules go out for public comment. So <laughs> if there's places where yeah. we miss the mark and, you're, yes. and there's conflicts that we didn't realize existed, 
we, we want to know about that so that we can course correct when we go to finalize these rules. Thank you both for your valuable insights in Tosca and environmental justice. Let's finalize with another quote. Justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. So let's strive for environmental justice for all.